All right, welcome back to Noob School. This is where we interview great salespeople and great business people, and we find out how they got started and how that might benefit you to hear their story. And today I've got a good friend, Joey Sullivan. Joey's a fellow Citadel graduate, and, and I've known him for quite some time. Um, and he's got a great story to tell. He's he sold lots of different things uh, in his life, and I think he'll continue to do some, do so. So welcome, Joey. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, uh, when did you graduate from the Citadel? I uh, graduated in 1995. 95. What a year. Uh, interesting year. Interesting. It was a time of change at the Citadel, for, for sure. What was changing? We had the Shannon Faulkner lawsuits Ooh, going on at yeah. the time. Okay. Um, amongst other, other, other things. things, the Corps Cadets was going through a, a massive change with the, uh, the president was leaving, okay. the commandant was leaving. Yeah. And it was just a big time of change within the school. It was kind of an interesting time. Seems like it's always that way. It's always. always something going Everything on. Everything is. It's been around 200 years, and it's always like every, every year it's like, oh, my gosh, it's crazy now. It's wild. Um, yeah, so anyway, we both went there, and it was, it was crazy when I went there. We had Stockdale uh -huh. for one year, when I, Admiral Stockdale, when, when I was, a, a, I guess, a freshman. That didn't last long, and that was another crazy time. That, uh, that was a crazy time. And a war hero. I mean, he was, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, before we get to my first question, you came to see me shortly after graduation, and we didn't know each other at that point. He made an appointment with me, and most of the 95 Citadel graduates were coming to me for jobs. Yeah. Joey came to me trying to get me to sponsor a race car, okay? I was looking for money. Yeah, so yeah, was, my yeah. dad and I were, were – uh, we had joined a series called the Grand Am Series. Yeah. We were running a BMW Z3 M Coupe in the Street Stock Series. Yeah. And, and we were looking for money to buy tires and <laughs> and buy fuel and yeah. and go to race. And we there's an important lesson in that, which is you can you can budget for something and plan something really well and and have one really great weekend and go through a year's budget in the weekend mm -hmm. uh, with, with a lot of things going wrong. So right. New but agent. it was fun. It was yeah. a great experience in life, and uh, yeah. uh, I can honest, honestly say I still enjoy the car racing. Yeah, some not yeah. as much as I'd like to. Yeah. And, and you know, I have a kid now, and I have he's about to go to college, and yeah. so you're, you know, everything changes in life, and your priorities change. And yeah. that was kind of one of those, one of those times in life where I didn't have a kid, and I had a wife who was very tolerant of, yeah. of my illnesses, as the I week, call it, the weekend illness. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I, what I remember was. You know how how positive you were, and confident you were to be tromping in my office. You know at, at age twenty two, saying you don't want a job with me, which everyone did at that time, but you would like me to you know, get a decal on your car. <laughs> it's like, Joey, I like what you're doing here. How is this going to help my company? And I don't remember what you said, but it it was more like. We'll figure it out, or I don't know what it was. Uh, maybe for the customers. Actually, my customers were maintenance people. They probably yeah. would have loved, you know, that we were doing a race thing. They, they would have loved it. We uh, had we had one customer who actually would bring some people to the racetrack. Yeah, and they'd hang out in the pits with us, and they, you know, got to do ride-alongs in the cars. We did some stuff like that, which yeah. was kind of fun. And it is fun. It, uh, it's it's just a very expensive endeavor, and it's one of those things where you just try to get enough money to. To do it, um, the race winnings. Uh, a lot of people look at these, you know, these races on TV, and they think, "God, oh, those guys make lots of money." And the money isn't in the racing; mm -hmm. it's it's literally in the sponsorship programs and the mm -hmm. in the backing programs. Which which is really, you know, for, I think for our audience, <clears throat> we hear words like sponsorships and backing. That's sell. That's selling. Yes, it is. Right. Call it what you want. It you is. are selling a sponsor or someone to get the decal or or, or the ride arounds or whatever it is. You've got the inventory. Someone's got to sell it. That's that's the truth. And I, I laugh because one of the greatest examples I see is in Formula One. Uh -huh. And there's a the, for, the Ferrari team has a thing called Mission Minnow or Minnow Mission. I'm not sure which one it is. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks at it and like, what is this thing? And it's actually a it's actually a foundation mm -hmm. that rep that's owned by Marble Marlboro Corporation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And cigarettes are legal in the sport, so what do they do? They create a side foundation to, and so whatever you can do to attract attention for that sponsor, that's what you do. And yeah. That's kind of how they've done it. And yeah. uh, for us, it was just about 
enjoying our passion, our hobbies, yeah. and uh, you know, trying to help offset the cost of it. And we had a, we had a great time. That's cool. Fun. I think it's a very cool hobby, and you're still doing it today. Which I is, uh, yeah, he took me out to his warehouse and showed me a couple of the cars he's working on and what he races. So that's pretty good. But tell me, you know, you got out of school, and besides the racing, where where did you get started in sales? So I uh, graduated from the Citadel. Um, first, I, and I'll say this, the Citadel was good for me. Mm-hmm. I was uh, a bicycle racer. Mm-hmm. So I had this impassioned dream. I was going to race bikes. Mm-hmm. I was going to do some sort of racing because I'm very competitive in nature and Graduated from the Citadel, um, went to the Citadel because I needed structure. Mm -hmm. I will be freely admit that. I think had I not gone to school, I would have tried to race bikes professionally and not sure I had the genetics to race at a Lance Armstrong level, Mm -hmm. um, which is okay. Yeah. You know, know, I I realized that early on. Um, I got out of college and I can't remember what my first job was, but sales were kind of something I fell into because that's what everybody in the family did. Mm-hmm. That's what my dad did, my sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, they all worked in insurance. And what I, did you major in? I was a business administration major. Okay, which so. is kind of a, unless you have like an accounting major, you're kind of, kind of mean sales, right? It's sales or management or. Well, who's going to hire us to manage anyone? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, at age no, 21. No, and you got to prove yourself. Yeah. They want you to go out there and prove yourself and, um, I learned day one, it's about a number. It's not about you. Yeah. It's about your ability to produce. Yeah. And you get out there, they want to see you produce. It was, what do you have and what can you produce? And that was, for me, that was my kind of my first lesson. I was a Gallagher intern in college with mm-hmm. Arthur J. Gallagher Corporation, and they had just bought my dad's insurance agency. Okay. And the plan was to go in the insurance business. Mm-hmm. And I spent a whole summer working with my dad, thinking this is what I want to do. And I finished the summer working with my dad, and I'm like, I don't want to work for my dad. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I was going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And I got out of college, and I took a job with a steel company. Hmm. And a real good lesson for me, uh, it was a a smaller company with a really controlling family. Uh, I mean, when I say controlling, I mean like, they knew every step you were taking and everything mm-hmm. you're very micromanaged and it wasn't a great environment for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I realized it and I, but I, I learned from it and I learned that, that I guess the greatest lesson was you're a number mm-hmm. as terrible as that sounds, <laughs> you're a number and you have to have an ability to produce. And, and I think, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned from it was creating your own system of, you know, what works for you. Mm-hmm. I don't. I think without that, and I, I think every every book I've read, and, and yours included, is you have to create your own system. Mm-hmm. You have to have structure and create your own system. Yeah. Because if you don't have it, you're not going to go anywhere with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think if you don't have, and again, there's different systems, right? Some people like to work all night. Some people like to work early in the morning. Um, but if you don't have one, human nature is we're going to all chase the shiny object and watch netflix and you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know oh, yeah. all that stuff oh yeah i've got my list in the morning man i, I get on jacob notes i go down my list and you know until around, usually around, around noon my day is pretty scripted yeah and then i let loose a little bit i'm and see i'm opposite okay see? I'm, I'm a morning person okay. i like to get up early in the morning uh i get i shuffle my son out the door at eight o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and i like to get on my my company computer and get my stuff done yeah, I, I want my Get stuff. Early. I want my stuff done by two o'clock. Yeah. I, I try to schedule lunches when I can. Yeah, uh, as terrible as it sounds, I like for my day to be over by three or four o'clock if yeah. I can. Yeah, so I can go ride my bike or do what I need to do, yeah. and, or plan for what I have going on the rest of the week because yeah. I have a bit of travel with my work now. I used to think, you know, you know, because when I when I grew up, you know, watching my dad, it was like out the door at seven and home at six. I mean, every day. And, and then I spent a little time in California, and I saw those dudes, and they were like, you know, lunch, after lunch, they're like, well, what do you want to do now? Want to surf? You want to go for a bike? I mean, they had that different mindset that they were going to control their day the way they wanted to. And, and of course, the time difference helped, too, because, you know, by 2 o'clock out there, it was 5 here. I was yeah. quitting time here, but. And I was doing a bike trip across Spain a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. businesses shut down at 3 o'clock. 
and it amazed me. And yeah. but you talk to these people, and you know they had a, you know, two or three o'clock. They shut down till about four or five, and mm-hmm. they opened for two or three more hours and finish off their day. And it yeah. was just it's a different way of doing it. Everybody has their own way. Yeah. And I, you know, mine. Is, I'm more of a morning person. Mm-hmm. I gotta have my coffee. Gotta yeah. have. You well, know. the Citadel guys, you started with that when you had yeah. to toe the line at 0600 every day. That's, that's right. It's hard to believe we did that. And I was I was always in trouble, so I was always doing PT at, at 5.30. Beforehand? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Um, now, I know um, besides sales, you've done some other things that, in business that we wouldn't consider sales. What are some, what are some of the other things you've done? Most of my career has been sales. I, um, in a recent past life, as mm-hmm. I like to say, I... I worked for uh, worked in the dealership business, mm-hmm. which I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And but I was one of the few guys who was actually kind of a technician too. I could work on anything, and that goes back to my car racing. Yeah, I can work on stuff, fix stuff, um, still do it. Yeah, you know, I, I enjoyed it, and I think it's part of your package as a salesperson. Yeah, what do you bring to the table? And yeah. for me, it was a customer could pick up the phone and call me and say, "Hey, I got this problem. What can I do?" And I yeah. could, I can walk them through it. I think it's an excellent point. So. We've established that Joey's an excellent salesperson and that he has, you know, experience um, driving a car and under the hood of a car and on the, everything about a car. I mean, if you if that's your hobby, you know it inside and out. And so when he left insurance and got in the dealership business, which is multiple, which is not necessarily cars, it would be bigger. Like, what do you call them? I, I was selling RVs. RVs. Okay. I, was, so, I was selling everything from a travel trailer to million dollar buses. To buses. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the whole thing. And so, you know, if you take someone that we would say, hey, this guy's a really good sales guy, and maybe he's, you know, they're trying to sell this bus, Joey's value add is he links his selling skills in with the fact that he knows how the bus runs, how the bus works, what really the real gas mileage is and what kind of tire you should put on it and the kind of stuff I would I would want to talk to him if I was buying a bus versus some clever fast talking, you know. And and I now I had a fault with that too. I was very blunt. <laughs> That's all right. And I'm I would, you know, customers would come to me and say, "Hey, I you know, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this and you know, what are the pros and cons of these?" And yeah. I would sometimes say, "Hey, you know, you're you're Spending the same money for an inferior product, yeah. and and uh, I laugh because uh, something that I learned in sales is that you can't always tell people, and I don't know how to say this the easiest way. Sometimes when you tell people something, and you think you're leading them away from it, you're actually driving them to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so it for me it I I, I have to. I, I came from the Citadel, uh-huh. and I have this very deep sense of ethics in what I do, yeah. and especially in the insurance business. Yeah, because almost yeah. twenty years in the insurance business, to me, it was important to be ethical and mm-hmm. be upfront and be blunt. Yeah, and if people had a question, you didn't BS it. You just said, "Hey, that is not covered." Or, yes, mm-hmm. it is. Or if you do that, you are asking for legal problems mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, you had to be. Yeah. You, there was a, a fine line you had to draw. And when I went to the RV business, I had to deal with a lot of those fast talking salespeople. Yeah. And they would these customers would come in and say, Hey, I'm buying this three hundred thousand dollar motorhome and mm-hmm. and it's got this, 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 and this. And I'd say, Yeah, it does, but you know, let, let's look at let's look at the long term values of this product yeah. versus this. Yeah. And mine costs the same, but it's got real real wood cabinetry versus fake and it, or whatever it was, yeah. you know. And it it made for really interesting to sell against people that were selling products that qu- weren't quite the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the biggest things people didn't realize was RVs is a cottage industry. Um, imagine taking your house and putting it on wheels and riding it down the road. <laughs> what what will happen with it? Everything's going to shake loose, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's an RV. Mm-hmm. And so getting people to understand that Hey, you're going to have problems with this, yeah. and it's part of the maintenance of it. Uh-huh. And where other people would say, the other dealer, other dealers would say, or dealer salespeople, oh, you'll never have a problem with it. I was very blunt. Hey, you're going to have a problem. This is why. Yeah. And well, that's a, you know, you've read the Challenger Sale. You read that book? The Challenger I have Sale? not. Well, uh, the noobs should all read it, <clears throat> but it's it's kind of about what you've already been doing naturally, which is. 
to be so such an expert at what you're selling and to be comfortable that you will challenge the prospect yeah. and say, I hear what you're saying. I don't want to run you off, but, you know, I just finished redoing three of these buses like this, and you need to know this is the answer, you know. I, I would do that, but I would also take it a step further and go show them. Well, that's even better. I would literally pull the panel off the wall and say, hey, yeah. you see this? Yeah. You know, they use nails to put this yeah. up. Well, and, you're doing you know, exactly and, and what the, you know. the challenger guy says. You know, if, if you if you go to a, a doctor about something very important, you'd like that person to be a challenger doctor. You know, not someone who says, well, okay, if that's what you read on the Internet, let's do it. You know, it's like, no, no, this is what I just learned from 14 patients, and we're going to go this way. And so, anyway, I'm, I'm not surprised that's the way you do it. Let me ask you this question a little bit different. Before you went into sales, and maybe early on you had some ideas in your mind about what sales was going to be like, can you tell us what are some of the things that are different about sales than you thought? Sales aren't easy. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's, I, and I'm a very keep it simple sort yeah, of guy, you yeah. know, the old kiss prospect, keep mm-hmm. it simple, stupid, you know. Um, I, I learned that sales is very uh, proportional to how much work you put into it Yeah. with your, with your customers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, if you don't put the time and effort into it, uh-huh. it's not going to lead very far. Yeah. And Working in the insurance business especially, there's mm-hmm. a lot of front-end paperwork that had to occur, a lot of middle stuff, and then a lot of closing stuff. And it was a whole process. Yeah. And you had to really feed yourself into it, and you had to believe in it. Mm-hmm. And so I guess for me, an important thing for me is I have to believe in the process that I'm, I'm working. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it is – it's like believing in whatever your politics are, mm-hmm. believing in – and what's the right way to pump gas in your car mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You kind of had to have a system and a, and a belief structure that went with it. And so I've always kind of kept that, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. But <laughs> but um, I guess that's kind of the biggest thing for me was, yeah. was having a, you know, a, a system go with it and yeah. a belief structure. Yeah. And I would, I would just add on to that, add on to the tangent, re-tangent maybe. But, you know, let's say an easy sale – Somebody walks onto the lot and they want to buy something and you sell them something. And that's kind of an easy bluebird Saturday. That's a 1% deal. Okay, a 1% deal. Most, and by the way, most of it was I come in, I look, I'll think about it. Yeah. And that's where my job started. Right. Was, hey, let me get your information. Education. Let me educate you on yeah. this. And, oh, yeah. You know, your wife's nervous about driving a big old forty foot motor home. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you bring her back and let's let's put her in it? Yeah, let's do it. And it'd be like, hell no. That mm-hmm. would be the response. Was <laughs> it wasn't no, I'm not doing it. It'd be like, hell no, I'm not doing it. And you know, you had to literally get these people to buy into it. Yeah. And by the way, my mom is five foot four, uh-huh. and my parents have a motor home. And my selling point when when they were looking which was way before I got into the business, yeah. was, Mom, can you drive this thing? And she's like, hell no, I can't drive it. And, you know, to this day, Mom still drives one. That's cool. And so you had to find what the little buttons to push were with every yeah. every person. Yeah. And every once in a while you get that guy that would come in and buy. But yeah. typically he'd bought two or three before, and he had a relationship somewhere Yeah, with someone or something. Yeah, that, that's, I guess... I get it. That's very rare that happens. And that's part of your point is sales aren't easy. But my definition of sales are are work and sales are hard would be how hard it would be to get that relationship with that person where they bought one from you, they've traded it, they bought another, they've traded it, they're looking for another one, their nephew needs one, their brother wants one, and pretty soon they just look at you with complete trust. Yes to take care of them if they want something. And you don't have to worry too much about price or anything else. You just know Joey is going to take care of us. That's hard to get to that point. Yet, once you get there, it's kind of easy. It's easy once you get there. And I had customers who bought five from me. Yeah, I know you did. I had one that in two years bought five from me. And the last two, I told them not to buy it. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. You don't need to be buying these. And and she, she still bought them. Yeah. And... 
it kind of goes back to you tell them to do something and they do the exact yeah. opposite of, uh, you know don't buy it well they buy it and it's uh, it's almost like the uh, almost like the Sandler method of sales where mm-hmm. you go negative on mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. and it wasn't something that I I, I enjoy that method mm-hmm. it's not something I really practice regularly mm-hmm. but I did a good job with it when when Acc- I had that accidentally customers. accidentally yeah. um <clears throat> so what what are some of the good things you did along the way, particularly when you started and you were ramping up and learning and starting to make your number and all that? What were some of the things you would pass along to the noobs that would be helpful? For me, it was about doing what you'd say you'd do. Uh huh. So yeah. I'd make a contact. I'd, yeah. You know, I'd meet a John Sterling. Yeah. Get his number and information, and we'd work through the process. We'd sell him a camper. You know, in a month, reach out to him. Set yourself a reminder in your phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a month, hey, how's everything going? You have any problems? You know, if you are, bring it to me. Let's fix it. Let's yeah. get this addressed. Yeah. Three months, do it again. Six months, do it yeah. again. If, I, just little things like that, little yeah. touches. That's uh, a little thing, but it's it's everything. You know, birthdays. Uh, write down their birthday. Yeah. And by the way, this is not really information you're supposed to have, but when they're filling out those applications. Mm-hmm. And you're and you're putting them in the fo- file folder. You see the birthday. The first thing on top is that birthday. You put it in your phone. And I would just put it in my phone. It'd pop up, and I'd send a happy birthday note. I like it. And I like it. And some people were sensitive about it. And you had to be careful about those people. But yeah. some people would be like, "Oh my gosh," you know. And and I would say little things like, "Hey, come on in and buy something today. We'll give you thirty percent off." Uh-huh. And then I'd go back in the back and parts and say, "Hey, we gotta give them thirty percent off because I told them." We give them a special because it's their birthday yeah. day, and parts would be mad at me, and yeah. and <laughs> and they'd end up with a pretty nice size order from it, yeah. and they'd be okay with yeah. it. So, you know, I, I've heard that before. That was my my brother's answer, brother Dan. He just said, if you just start by doing what you say you're going to do, getting there early, calling back when you say you will, getting the proposal on Tuesday like you promised. I mean, so many people don't do that, and you're just and, disqualified. And by the way, if you have a mad customer. One of the best things I learned about mad people is, one, let them vent. Mm-hmm. And two, if you didn't know the answer, say, I don't know the answer, but I'll get back to you by 2 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't have the answer, you call them at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Don't leave them hanging. You're building trust. Was there anything <clears throat> sales-wise you wish you'd have known when you started? Once again, going back to it's not simple. Mm-hmm. You have to work it. You've got to work it hard. Um I learned that if I wasn't passionate about it, I didn't. For me, passion means a lot. Mm-hmm. So if I'm not passionate about something, I won't do as well with it. Mm-hmm. I have to have something that I dig into that I enjoy. And I've learned with some with some companies. Like I worked for one company, and I love the people dearly. I left because I could not dig into the culture of the business, and I just I didn't like the politics. It was a big company. I didn't like the politics and. And I found that I do better in smaller companies. Mm-hmm. And the political side of it was so incredibly detailed and difficult that I just didn't want to play the games of it. Yeah. And it wasn't good. It wasn't a good environment for yeah. me. Yeah. And the sad part is I look back and I left a really good job for it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And it was a and it was a hard time in my life too. Mm-hmm. I was going through some stuff at home. Yeah. We all have that. It's sure. all it's all part of that mix that we have in our lives right. and. You got to separate your your home life from your work life, obviously. That's right. Yeah. But in that particular case, you know, um, find what works for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the yeah. biggest thing I tell people is find the yeah. environment that's going to work for and you. And I love that point, and I'll, I'll promote the book a little bit. But we talk about that in the book, and one of the reasons I wrote the book is because when I was getting out of school, I was ambitious. I, I wanted to be entrepreneurial. That's about. I had it narrowed down to that. I didn't know where I wanted to work, what size company, what I wanted to sell. I didn't know anything. And I couldn't figure out how to whittle it down. And it took me a lot of this one doesn't work, that one doesn't work until I found the right spot. Um, And so I'm trying to encourage people, instead of making that wrong move, is to really stop and think about what fits me best, what size company, what am I selling, how much money am I going to make, how hard do I have to work, how much do I have to travel, figure all that out. To get your does, it, does it fit in your heart? It sounds weird, yeah. but you yeah. know, you know, I, I've, I have, and I think we've all been there before. Have you ever sat down and interviewed with somebody that just rubbed you the wrong way? Yeah, 
(laughs) And I had that once in an interview. I'll never forget it. The guy rubbed me the wrong way Mm -hmm. and had a job offer sitting there. And he's, it was really positive. And and I just, I couldn't do it. Yeah. I just knew that down the road, he and I were going to have issues with each other and didn't really agree with it. And, you know, it's got to be a good fit for you. That's intuition. Your intuition is normally right. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Um, So, Joey, what's your favorite word? That's a hard one. I, I, That's a phrase. It, it is. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it was funny. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, I, I know what my favorite smell is. I know it's. I'll say it's not pollen from Charleston mm-hmm. in the springtime. Yeah. Uh, you know, I went through. I went through a kind of a difficult time in my life. Mm-hmm. I, I lost my wife a couple of years ago to cancer and. She would always talk about peace, mm. and I never understood what she meant. Mm-hmm. And I guess for me, I realized I needed peace in my home life, in my work life. You needed a balance. Mm-hmm. And so it, I would say it's probably either peace or the word balance itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as strange as it sounds, and I think because we're always searching for it. Mm-hmm. We're always searching for that happy medium in our life yeah. that that keeps us on an even plane. Yeah, balance. Yeah. You know. That's good. That's a great that's a great piece. Balance. I'll let you you're the first person in forty one podcasts you get two words. You get peace and oh, balance. Well thank you. Um lastly, just I know you're doing different a couple of different things now between racing and some private work on your own. You want to promote what you're doing? So right now I'm, I'm working with a company called Carolina Streetscapes. Okay. Uh we we work with Development contractors mainly. Mm-hmm. We do the mailbox systems. We okay. deal with the headaches of, okay. the, of the post office, which okay. is kind of unusual in itself. Uh, and we we do a lot of different things. I'm, I'm working with a lot of HOAs and a lot of manage, uh, property management. Hold on for a second. I got to explain yeah. to these people yeah. what you're talking about because yeah. it took me about 30 minutes, so now <laughs> I know what he does. If someone's cutting a new neighborhood, correct? You can't in around here. You can't put up mailboxes anymore. So. You have to go, you have to put up these things, like a little P.O. box thing, where everyone goes by and your box and yeah. someone else all, all together, they're, right? They're called CBUs. CBUs. Uh, cluster box units. Yeah, and, a CBU. And the, by the way, the post office has a regulatory system. If, if you had to put in a book, it would be about about 300 of your books, I think. <laughs> it is probably that, that thick of all the regulations. Yeah. And this company came to me asking me, to work the upstate of South yeah. Carolina and, and work. So he's basically state. calling on developers, pretty much, and saying, "We'll take care of this CBU issue for you." In the story, right? And and it sounds easy. Well, I don't know. it sounds like they put in a mailbox, they forget about it. But the post office wants assignments done, and they need certain so spreadsheets. Any, any, any and, developers like Bill Beatty, yeah. for example. Bill Beatty's a great example. Okay. Uh, his 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 group did a neighborhood in downtown Greenville, yeah. and. Uh, but you have a lot of these big home builders like Lennar, yeah. um, Mungo Homes. Mungo. Uh, a lot of these big developers, you know, big, and really they do the houses, but but they're hiring somebody to clear that land. Yeah. And so I'll work with those guys or I'll work with an HOA that's, mm. that is having to tear out mailbox systems yeah. and stuff. And, and, and can I also <laughs> add, if anyone wants to learn about racing mm-hmm. or go on a hot lap with Joey, you got to pay him a few bucks, but he'll take you around the lap. We, safe, right? It is safe. We okay. we don't race like we did years ago. Uh-huh. We we now uh, focus on vintage cars. Uh-huh. We run a uh, couple races a year, uh, and basically basically historic and vintage racing. Yeah. Uh, our our biggest one that coming up is end of April at Road Atlanta, uh-huh. uh, but we'll run Daytona, Sebring, Florida. Yeah. And, uh, keep talking about going to Road America in Ohio or, or uh, Watkins Glen. Uh, I don't know if we can. The problem is finding the time to do it all. <laughs> you know, a kid in college, and you know, I do the, I do some bike trips on the weekends, yeah. and I do a little bit of sailing, and I kind of, I, yeah. I've got a girlfriend. It's kind of a you're a renaissance man. I'm, I guess I am. I don't know. So, so Joey can help you with just about anything: so. racing, or mailboxes, or RVs, or hot laps, sailing. No, as long as it's not love lives, I'm good. Love so, lives. You know. So well, we want to thank you on behalf of the Noob School for being here today, Joey. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Take care. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Bam. Did that go okay? You crushed it. Well, thank you.